uh, good evening. Thank you for the kind introduction and for organizing this event. All of us in this room agree on the value of the family in our lives. We might disagree as to what the family should be like or should not be like, what it should do or should not do. And I think that is understandable. After all, we all tend to view the family through the lens of our religious and cultural beliefs and personal experiences. The family is also important to governments because healthy, functioning families play an essential role in individual, human, social, and economic development. At the other hand, dysfunctional or weak families place a heavy burden on society and on the state. It's not surprising, therefore, that most countries adopt policies that support the main or primary functions of the family, and these are family formation and dissolution, partner relationships, child rearing, family caregiving, and economic support. So what is family policy? There are no consensus on the definition, but experts differentiate between explicit family policies and implicit family policies. Explicit family policies are government's actions which target supporting the main functions of the family. For instance, in the case of family formation, they regulate marriage, divorce, custody of children, adoption, and other related matters. Implicit family policies are not directed at families, but they, are, but they affect families indirectly, either positively or negatively, like education and employment policies. In my presentation, I will describe the historical evolution of family policies in Qatar till the emergence of what I call the family cohesion agenda, in the Qatar Vision and National Development Strategy of 2011-2016. I will try to explain the objectives of this agenda and the challenges facing its implementation. I will also look at the institutional frameworks to deliver family policies. Finally, I will share with you the actions I recommend for achieving Qatar Vision of Cohesive Families. At the outset, let me say clearly that while I think Qatari families should be the primary targets of policy making in Qatar, these policies should also take in consideration the well-being of all families in Qatar. This is challenging. Just consider the fact that uh, uh, expat families or foreign families outnumber Qatari families. If this is not enough, these families come from diverse cultural and religious backgrounds. I will be talking for about 30 minutes, I hope less, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. To understand the family in Qatar, you need to understand two things. One, the family to policy makers and to Qataris in general is not your textbook nuclear family. It's the extended family. Islam stipulates specific obligations and rights for kin members, including inheritance rights, and these rights are legal. This definition of the family in theory and in practice supports community and social cohesion. It also contributes to solidarity between younger and older generations in the family. And second, the tribe predates the state in this part of the world. Today, the tribe might have lost some of its authority over its member families and its economic role, but it's still a major force in family life, and it's supported by the continuing practice of intermarriage and a unique system of tribe or family-based neighborhoods. Now, let's look briefly at how the emergence of the state in the second half of the last 20th century, 19th, 20th century, affected the family. In the 2004 Qatar Constitution recognizes the family as the basic unit of society 
and confirms that state laws will regulate adequate means to protect the family, to support its structure, and to strengthen its ties. This same language was used in the temporary constitution adopted in 1970. This language echoes that of Article 16.3 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The language of the UDHR is found in a large number of constitutions around the world. Some of them, including that of Germany, I've been told, included a reference to marriage. This reference to marriage is redundant in Qatar. Since marriage is the only foundation of the family in Islam, and Qatar clearly stated in Article 1 of its constitution that its religion is Islam, and Sharia law is the, major, uh, is the main source for its legislations. And in Article 21 in, in the constitution, which is devoted to the family, it states that a Qatari fam family is founded on religion. A quick search of the online legal quota of Qatar shows that the first family policies were adopted in the 1960s. In 1963, a social security law providing monthly cash assistance to low-income families, widows, divorcees, as well as for orphan, orphans was adopted. It was followed in 1964 by a housing law providing funding and land to low-income families to build their homes. The implementation of these laws was assigned to a Department of Labor and Social Affairs, which formed part of the central government unit, uh, government until a separate ministry for labor and social affairs was established in 1970. In 1989, the first direct intervention by the government in family formation appeared in the, in the form of the law regulating marriage with non-nationals. Qatar was not unique in wanting to regulate marriages that have implications on nationality rights. The law was passed in response to growing marriages between Qatari men and non-Qatari women, and growing problems relating to nationality claims. During that period, Qatari men were growing richer and they started to explore the Middle East and other countries. The law does not regulate marriage with GCC nationals. This type of marriage is widely accepted because oftentimes it's marriage within the family and because these countries are very similar in culture and living standards. The law requires the approval of the Ministry of Interior before getting married to a non-national. For women, it also requires the approval of her father or guardian. The children of a Qatari woman from a foreign father, according to this law, will be treated like Qataris in matters of education, health care, and employment. Once they are 18, they can apply for citizenship. The 1990s marked a new chapter in Qatar's social development and family policy. The Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs was reorganized in 1990, and it was given for the first time the responsibility to propose the policies and means to protect the family and care for motherhood and childhood. From 1995, Her Highness Sheikha Moza Nasser emerged as a major leader of social development in Qatar. And I will speak here only about Her Highness' role as a champion of the family and women's rights. It started in 1996 with her establishment of the Family Development Center, now the Social Development Center under QF. The mission of the center is community development by focusing on families and women, and it was the first time the first private organization in Qatar that adopted a development and empowerment approach in its work through capacity building and advocacy. The first ever entity focusing on the family soon followed. State entity, I have to say. The Supreme Council for Family Affairs was established in 1998 and headed by Her Highness Sheikha Moza until 2009. 
Scafa was charged with all matters relating to family, to the family, including proposing legislations, policies, and plans, and implementing pro programs and projects to enhance family well-being and promote women and child rights. The role of the ministry was limited mainly to implementation of the housing and social security laws. Around the same time also, the government established a committee of religious scholars and legal experts to codify the family law. SCAFA contributed to the drafting of this law by providing more than 50 proposals, but only a few were actually adopted by the drafting committee. This showed the conflict between conservatives and modernists within the policy circles of the country. The law was adopted in 2006, but it was actually applied on a trial basis for a number of years. Other important laws were adopted in the same period with the help of SCAFA during this time, such as revised housing law, which included more rights for women. In addition to her role as president of SCAFA, Her Highness tried proactively to confront the dysfunction and breakdown of families by establishing a number of private institutions that provided direct services to families in general and women in particular. I'd like to highlight two of them. The first, the Family Consultation Center, was established in 2002 to provide marriage education, family consultation services, and assist the family courts in family mediation and custody arrangements. According to a study by SCAFA in 2013, 3,147 Qatari individuals and 2,331 expat individuals benefited from the services of the center in 2012. The second is the Foundation for the Protection of Children and Women, now part of Qatar Foundation for Social Protection and Rehabilitation. It was established in 2003 to combat domestic violence and violence against women and children. The foundation provided protection services, legal assistance, awareness raising, and training for service providers and professionals working with women and children. The same study by SCAFA in 2013 showed a steady increase in the number of the Qatari and expat beneficiaries of the services provided by this organization from 2009 to 2013. These examples show the existing demand for the services that these organization, organizations provide by both Qatari and expat families. They also raise a question of whether these organizations can alone meet the growing demand for their services and highlight the lack of other organizations providing similar services. Let me pause here for a minute to say that Qatar was the first GCC country to break the taboo of domestic violence and violence against women. We still have to do more. But at the same time, Violence against women in the expat community is still a taboo, and we don't know enough. And it's something that you need to speak up about. Going back, the role of Her Highness as a champion of the family was not limited to Qatar. In 2006, Her Highness established the Doha International Family Institute, DIFI, with the mandate to promote the family at the national, regional, and international levels through research, policy, and outreach. Now let's look at the family in the context of Qatar Vision 2030 and the National Development Strategy of 2011-2016. I assume most of you are aware of Qatar Vision, so I will be brief. The vision aims to transform Qatar by 2030 into a modern country capable of sustaining its own development and providing for a high standard of living for this and future generations of its people. One of the critical challenges the vision needed to address 
is the preservation of Qatar cultural and traditional identity as an Arab and Islamic nation that considers the family as a pillar of society. Therefore, one of the desired outcomes of the social development pillar of this vision is developing and maintaining, and here I quote, strong cohesive families that care for their members and maintain moral and religious values and humanitarian ideas. There's a lot of literature on family cohesion. And there are survey techniques as well as observation techniques which have been developed to measure family cohesion. Experts write about a number of characteristics that define cohesive families, such as communication, commitment to the family, low levels of conflict, clear roles, religious orientation and spirituality and social connectedness. As far as I know, no research was done in Qatar to measure family cohesion and family strengths. This is the vision. So let's look at how the national strategy planned to help Qatar achieve this vision of the family. The strategy seeks to address some of the trends affecting Qatari families, such as the rising divorce rates, high proportions of women who marry late or remain single for life, the growing levels of family violence, the dependence on domestic helpers in caring for children, family work conflict, and the alarming rates of personal death among Qatari families. The strategy designed projects to address all these trends, set targets, and desired outcomes. A midterm review of the progress in implementation of the strategy has been made but the results have not been published yet. As someone who participated in drafting this strategy and in retrospect, I have to say that the strategy focused on the dysfunction in families and failed to adopt a comprehensive approach to strengthen family cohesion. The only justification for this limited scope was, I think, our awareness that we did not have enough in implementing arms or implementing institutions. So we had to focus on stopping what we thought as the pleading ones. The success in the implementation of the strategy is conditional on a number of factors. There are the existence of strong public institutions, strong, civil, strong and active civil society, intersectorial coordination, and national expertise and capacity. This is, these were clearly stated in the strategy document. And these are the challenges facing the implementation of the strategy. The vision and the national strategy conceptualized a comprehensive social development agenda. So the important question is, has the development of the institutional frameworks rose to the same level? Family strategies are multi-sectorial in nature. They cannot be implemented by one ministry alone, but still one ministry or government unit should be designated to lead the design, implementation, and monitoring of the plan of action. In 2014, SCAFA, the leading implementing organization of the family strategy, was dissolved. Its role was transferred to the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. This should, have been, should not have been a problem in normal, in normal circumstances. But this ministry was itself reorganized during that time as two independent ministries for labor and social affairs were merged into one. The new ministry now has the responsibility to, to lead the implementation of three sectorial strategies, labor, social protection, family cohesion, and women's empowerment. It's somewhat disappointing that institutionally, the outdated concept of social affairs has not evolved into social development which is more appropriate in the context of the vision and the national strategy. There's also the risk 
that the social development agenda will be overshadowed by the labor agenda. In addition, the main civil society organizations that have specific roles in the implementation of the family strategy are also undergoing reorganization to strengthen their mandates and develop their working methods. The lack of enough community-based organization is a major challenge threatening the achievement of social development targets. Non-governmental organizations are instrumental in achieving family policies in every country. They act as a bridge between the families whose well-being the policies and strategies seek to serve and the government and its institutions that design and implement these policies. NGOs are more equipped to deliver family programs and services, especially when provided with enough funding and support from the government and the private sector. Qatar has a limited number of NGOs. Most are charity-based, and a few of these have some small conventional programs targeting families. The strict process for establishing NGOs is delaying the growth of community-based organizations and services for families. Unfortunately, we do not have any family or women organizations today. The National Human Rights Committee has repeatedly called in its annual reports to review law number 12 of 2004, governing the establishment of civil organizations. Any review should take in consideration, that's how I think, allowing more opportunity for expat membership in these organizations for three reasons. One, this organization could provide more services to expat families that isn't the burden on the existing organizations. And two, expat individuals could provide vulnerable, exper uh, valuable expertise to this organization. And three, this can lead to better community cohesion. Building national expertise and capacity to design, implement, and monitor family policies and deliver the required services, including family and parenting education, marriage and family counseling and mediation, child care and protection services for victims of domestic violence and child abuse requires investment in a long-term plan to build national expertise. As a starting point, the development of graduate degree in family studies should be a priority. Let me conclude. I need to emphasize that achieving Qatar vision of cohesive families requires a partnership between the government, civil society, the private sector, and first and foremost, families themselves. Thank you very much.